Hello, everybody. Terrence Lake, you here with another episode of the Intellectual Agrarian Podcast, where we talk philosophy from the farm. Our guest today is Anders Goethe, an associate researcher in organic and sustainable cropping systems with the University of Wisconsin Madison, and is the program manager of Ocrane, the Organic Grain Resource Information Network. Together, we discuss what oak grain does, the science of row cropping systems, and how small grains fit into the crop rotation puzzle, how mob grazing works, and I even get to learn a new word. Before we start the interview, I just want to put in a plug for our email list. If you sign up for our newsletter, the link in the description below, you will get exclusive first access to all of our videos before they're public. That's right, field notes, plowing through history videos, and whatever other videos we might produce, you would get the first look at it. By signing up, you'll also get notified when there's a new article or podcast episode available to listen to on the blog. And now that I've shamelessly talked about myself, let's talk with Anders. Anders, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Hey, great. Glad to be here. How are you doing today? Living the dream. (laughs) Awesome. So before we get started too far, I always like to ask kind of what brings people to agriculture, and in your case, more specifically, sustainable agriculture? Wow, big question. Uh, I can begin at the beginning. It might be a long answer, but I'll try to make it as efficient and succinct as possible. Um, So I'm actually a city kid, I think is one of the best places to start. I grew up in inner city Milwaukee, going to public schools, um, living the city dream. Uh, And that was wonderful, but I also was able to spend my summers uh, out in the wild places of our country as well as the cultivated places. So some of my earliest memories are on my great uncle Lawrence's tobacco farm in the Driftless, uh, smashing uh, tobacco worms against the ground and watching them explode. And <laughs> those those kind of early early memories uh, definitely stuck with me for a long time. Uh, fast forward to college, I went to school in northern Wisconsin, a little environmental liberal arts school called Northland College. And I spent my summers working on farms there. I kind of had, had realized the importance of agriculture, the relevance of, of growing food to all of life and to every citizen who have ever lived ever. Uh, and I wanted to learn more about growing food and to be able to kind of reclaim some of the power of being able to grow my own food. Uh, so I worked on little CSA organic farms around northern Wisconsin. There's a little kind of surprisingly robust community of, of organic agrarian folks up there. Um, and kind of cut my teeth uh, working out in the field, uh, getting calluses and getting sunburned and kind of desidifying myself a little bit, learning how to drive tractors and kind of getting getting the rope shown to me, if you will. Um, and... I loved agriculture. It was wonderful. Uh, I thought that I wanted to farm at that point. That's all that I wanted to do was to be able to run my own farm. Um, But after working for a couple of years for uh, for farmers that were doing everything right by all accounts and still having a hard time making ends meet, I realized that maybe I was better off supporting farmers uh, or educating people about farming. Uh, But I didn't know anything about education. So I uh, moved out to New York City, of all places to learn about environmental education, worked for the parks department, uh, taught kids about gardening and uh, nature, and uh, moved from there to Olympia, Washington, where I taught more kids about farming. Um, And through a couple of years and kind of meandering pathways, uh, ended up wanting to be able to marry my love of farming with my love of educating people about food and farming. Uh, And I got a degree in agroecology. Uh, UW Madison. I just graduated about three years ago. So not not just I did graduate about three years ago uh, and learned about rotational grazing there uh, and have since come to organic grain. Um, So it's a a long circuitous path. (laughs) But I guess the short answer is that uh, it seemed like one of the, the few omnipresently relevant things to humanity. Uh, that agriculture was something that everyone should know more about. And so I wanted to learn more about it and uh, fell down the rabbit hole and it's still fallen. That, I love how you make that point that agriculture is one of those few omnipresent things to people. Uh, every now mm-hmm. and again on our YouTube channel, we do a thing called Plowing Through History where we look at pretty much any time period in history, there are farmers supporting whatever historical event was happening. And it's always interesting just to see yep. how... In some ways, agriculture really hasn't changed that much from 
how they were doing it in ancient Rome or any time period you could pick out of your hat. So tell us a little bit about what you do at UW-Madison. Um, so at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, I run a program called O-Grain, which stands for the Organic Grain Resources and Information Network. Um, it's a big acronym, but it represents a pretty simple idea. And that's that we want to create as many resources as possible and host as many events as possible and build as much community as possible so that if a farmer wants to grow organic grain, they can. They're not, they're not in the dark. They have support, they have inspiration, and they have community. Um, and uh, O-Grain came about uh, because we at the university were observing that there was a shortage of organic grain, both food and feed, on the landscape. Mm-hmm. And we were also noting at the same time that you can get two to three times more uh, per bushel doing organic than you can conventional. And so we were utterly mystified. Why, why if you can make more money doing this, and there's a shortage, which then leads to being able to make more money doing this, mm-hmm. why aren't more farmers doing it? You know, why, why does the shortage persist? And so I did a little kind of interview of what I call the grain chain, small, small farmers, medium farmers, large farmers, distributors, buyers, processors, millers, um, to ask them all the same question. And the three most heard, most commonly heard refrains were, uh, number one, weeds are a big issue. People are afraid of, of weeds. Uh, and that makes sense. They are a really big issue in organic agriculture. But I think that that also is indicative of just, which is to say, agronomic shifts. There are going to be new issues that you have to deal with. People don't quite know how to do it. Number two was the transition. People were afraid of that gauntlet of transition where you're farming organically but getting conventional prices. And that makes sense. You you Mm -hmm. will lose money for a time getting towards that payoff. And the third issue was education. If people wanted to grow organic grain, they didn't know where to go. Um, And so I at the university and a couple of people, including Dr. Aaron Silva, who I work with there in the plant pathology department, started to think about the fact that we could produce some of the education to alleviate stressors like weeds and the transition. And so we wrote a grant to the USDA, got the grant a couple of years ago, and have been doing programming now for about two years. Wow. That's, and it, yeah. it is uh, one of those things where there is a huge shortage. I mean, everyone's, uh, a lot of people are talking about the imports, the import grain. If there was enough domestic, a lot of these guys wouldn't be importing as much. Yeah, that 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 is that's a hot button issue. <laughs> Import. Mm-hmm. I'm glad and not glad that you brought it up, uh, but that is something that has become uh, a topic of conversation at every event that we've had. Mm-hmm. You know, imports are depressing organic prices domestically, and so yeah. the what once what once was kind of a no brainer to get into organic grain it now takes a little bit more careful consideration that mm-hmm. the imports really are watering down the market, but we also have seen recently in the Washington Post article that came out what, two months ago um, that many of the imports coming in, oftentimes from Turkey and those areas of the world, they're not actually organic, that they have been able to do journalistic integrity and due diligence and find that things that are claimed as, as organic are actually changing from conventional to organic uh, while, while they're in the birth of the ship. And so there, there are real issues with imports mm-hmm. besides the fact that it's, it's depressing yeah. uh, domestic prices. Uh, it's one of those things where I'm really – it's a bad situation, but I'm looking forward to seeing how they fix it because it takes something like this happening for innovation, if you will, to occur in the system. It does. It does. It's true. And one thing that I feel heartened by is there are grain buyers, there are companies who are sourcing grain who are at least saying mm-hmm. that they want to be able to source domestically, that they might even put a premium on that, that that's mm-hmm. their ideal. They'd rather not import. And if that, that behooves them just to be able to have predictable yeah. quality and standards. Um, but I'm, I'm heartened by that. But I think it does in some ways need to be a market driven response. Mm-hmm. But we'll see. We'll yeah. see. But you're absolutely right. Yeah. And Really, if we're going towards that sustainable ideal that agriculture is, or at least organic agriculture is, we will be sourcing local. We will be sourcing closer to home. So again, we're, we're, it's exciting to see what happens. Yeah, I agree. I so agree. we just talked about it a little bit, but what what's the importance of small grains in the agricultural pie, like the big pie of the organic ag system? Where does small grains fit in there? That's a good question, and let me let me clarify to say that O grain actually works with all grains, including okay. grains that aren't grains. So we we, we do you know corn. And- 
technically not a grain, but they're kind of a leguminous grain as, as we think of them. Um, we also have been doing some more dry bean production. We have a field day coming up focusing on dry beans as well as other things. But we do also, as you say, focus on small grains, both food and feed. Mm-hmm. Um, and in, in the landscape, you know, I'm driving between Madison and Minneapolis right now, and I'm looking out over a, a driftless landscape. There's a little, little bit of pasture, a little bit of woodland, but primarily you see the binary cropping system of our state, which is corn and beans mm-hmm. of Wisconsin, my state, your state is obviously Illinois, of our general state, mm-hmm. um, of, of the whole Midwest. Um, and that, that binary system is something that it's a, it's a pretty elegantly efficient system. You know, it, you can get a lot of money from your acres pretty effectively and efficiently as long as you have the inputs and the resources necessary to, to prop up, to kind of crutch that production system. Mm-hmm. But that production system also has huge drawbacks, uh, many of which include erosion, siltation, nutrient loading in our waterways. Um, decreased diversity on the landscape. And we know from an ecological standpoint that diversity will always breed resilience. And if we want resilience, we need to increase diversity in our agricultural systems. So there, there, there are definitely some drawbacks to the corn and soybeans rotation. And so not even talking about organics right now, I think across the spectrum, conventional and non-GMO and transitional and organic, I think it does behoove farmers to think more actively about how to integrate small grains into their rotation. And there's some agronomic reasons, uh, like it can break disease cycles. You know, mm-hmm. so if you're not just doing corn, corn, beans, corn, beans, or corn, 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 as many people do, if you have a small grain in there, you're letting your land rest, you're breaking those disease cycles, you're breaking the pest cycles. So you're mm-hmm. giving yourself a little bit more of a leg up just by having a more natural and a more diverse rotation. Small grains are also a soil conditioning crop. Um, they're not quite as heavy feeding as something like corn is. And they also allow you to double crop. You know, you take that small grain off in July and you can plant a cover crop right after, or you can even spring sow a cover crop like alfalfa into a spring sown grain. Once you take that grain off, you let that alfalfa come up, you have a forage crop. You know, you have a fourth member of your rotation. Maybe you go into growing forages to get that nitrogen, nitrogen that you need. Now, if I could just Um, ask a quick question, Uh, a lot of people listening aren't farmers. What do you mean by heavy feeding crop? So heavy feeding. Um, Yeah. So something like corn uh, is definitely a a nitrogen addict. It needs a lot of nitrogen to be able to produce the 200 plus bushels that people like to be able to see. Um, And so it needs a lot of nutrients. And that's where uh, the nitrogen, synthetic based nitrogen fertilizers are something that is either, you know, knifed in 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 larger operations or maybe urea spread or whatever you use for the nitrogen, you are doing that for the corn. And then the soybeans grown in the intervening year, you know, that is going to fix its own nitrogen. You shouldn't need to put nitrogen on soybeans, and that should give you a little bit of a nitrogen credit to go back into the corn, but oftentimes you're still going to need supplemental nitrogen. And small grains do need nitrogen as well, absolutely. And so you can do an organic rotation where you have small grains following soybeans and that'll give you some nitrogen going into that and then you can plant a cover crop that might be as nitrogen fixing after the small grain so that you again have more nitrogen going into the heaviest feeding part of the rotation which is the corn absolutely i always just find these things fascinating i mean that's it's agriculture we've been doing it for hundreds of years and we're still learning about it i just think it's great Ten thousand years <laughs> So in your graduate thesis work, we're slightly shifting gears here. You made several videos about mob grazing. Now, for those who Mm. don't Mm -hmm. know, what is mob grazing and why is it so important? Great question. So the the way that I think about mob grazing uh, goes back to the the tall grass prairie uh, that used to cover much of the land that is now some of the richest soil in the entire world, which is in this breadbasket of, you know, Illinois, Wisconsin, Iowa, Minnesota, Indiana. Um, We have some of the richest soils in the entire world, and that is largely due to perennial cover of grasslands, but also the interplay of those grasslands with the native herbivores, such as bison, that would have grazed those areas. And so the way that bison were grazing was in these really huge herds. You know, you hear these million plus, you know, it, it took days for a herd to pass one area. You hear these stories. And they would graze very intensely, and they would evenly spread their manure. 
and then they would leave and then they might not come back to that same spot for months or years. Mm-hmm. And so it would be this really intense grazing and then some rest. And also I need to acknowledge that fire was a big part of the tall grass prairie just so ecologists don't get upset. Um, <laughs> and that's very true. But, you know, in the, in the agricultural system that we have now, the elements that we can kind of domesticate from that wild system mm-hmm. are the grass and the animal. And so what mob grazing does is it takes that idea of, you know, bison, tall grass, prairie interplay, and it domesticates it down to an agrarian scale, down to a domestic scale. And so those bison would have been kept in really tight herds by, by carnivores, by, mm-hmm. by wolves, you know, that would have been nipping yeah. at their heels. And so they would kept really tight. And so we replace the nip of the wolf with the nip of an electric fence. And we keep these cows in really tight herds. And we move them constantly, just as like a bison herd might move. And so some, some mob grazers are moving their animals eight times a day. So they have one small square. The animals eat all the grass. They move them to the next small square. Animals eat all the grass. They move them on. And that's called rotational grazing. A lot of other words for it, management-intensive rotational grazing, adaptive, high stocking density, all these names. But mob grazing is a really intense form of this. Um, and you are basically trying to biomimic is the word that I would use, which is a pretty elegant word, to biomimic the native system that we have in our area using domesticated livestock. That's the idea. Well, I am definitely taking the word biomimic and using it from now on. I've always just called it hijacking nature, but I like biomimic more. <laughs> oh, and I can definitely not claim that word. There's a, there's a book called Biomimicry that I would recommend you read. I'm blanking on the author, but it's a, it's a good book. Well, we'll definitely look it up and include it in the show notes. Now, one Beautiful. of the things you worked on with this mob grazing was uh, a project to control Canadian thistle. How did that work Correct. out? Uh, <laughs> variably. Uh, so, so the idea is that in pastures, perennial weeds become an issue. You have a perennial system, meaning that the grass is always there. You're not tilling, you're not planting, as you would in a corn and soybean system, right? And so it's a perennial system. And the grasses will do very well. These cool season grasses, you know, the orchard grasses and the fall fescue and the meadow fescue and all these, all these grasses do really well, but so do perennial weeds. And one of the biggest problem weeds in our area is Canada thistle. Uh, Canada thistle is also perennial. It's a beast of a weed mm-hmm. because it has two reproductive measures. It has rhizomes that spread underneath the ground and they can spread so that the whole kind of plant is basically one organism. And they also spread seeds. And so they, they become a pretty serious issue. And in a pasture, you can pretty easily control them by spraying a herbicide. Mm-hmm. Many herbicides are formulated for a Canada thistle. So you can spray those that's effective, but herbicides are non-target, meaning that they, they will kill everything. So they'll kill other broadleaf species, not, not grasses. They'll kill other broadleaves. You kill the thistle. You also kill all your clover. Mm-hmm. And in a really healthy pasture, you need a clover percentage uh-huh. you know you want you want up to 30 percent clover to be able to fix nitrogen to keep the soil healthy and to have diverse forage for your animal um and so you need that clover so it's a catch-22 you don't want canada thistle but you want your clover so what are you supposed to do if you can't spray if, if you if you have herbicide and you have these issues this, this collateral damage basically and so we thought that mob grazing might be a way to control the thistle without spraying chemical we thought this for a couple of reasons uh, we thought that just the mechanical damage, you know, all these hoofs and the cows lying down on the, on the thistle might actually impact it. Um, we also thought that a lot of the, the forage that the animals don't eat gets very trampled in a mob grazing situation. And we thought that that might form a really nice mulch. And it might, that mulch might have the same effect that mulching your tomatoes has, which is to retain soil moisture and to suppress potential weeds. Mm-hmm. We thought that might be an issue as well. There, there was, we thought there was other kind of modes of action that might control thistle. But what we found uh, was that in a productive pasture, uh, after two years of mob grazing, you have as effective control as you do with a herbicide application. Wow. Um, so it, it can be used to control Canada thistle, um, but really in productive pastures, it's a caveat. If you have an unproductive pasture, meaning your grasses are not competitive, um, and they're not going to be able to take over, then Canada thistle might might remain. Uh, and it might even get worse. You might just kind of piss it off. <laughs> so uh, so the, the caveat is in productive pastures, if used appropriately, it can work. You know, a lot of people think that mob grazing is just an all or nothing thing. Either you're a mob grazer or you're not. But the best definition that I've heard is a strategic application of a high stock density for a stated goal. 
So if you have thistle, you know, maybe try putting a smaller fence around that thistle patch and letting the animals stay in there for two days, you know, make them just a little bit hungry and make sure they're not dairy animals, obviously. Yes. <laughs> uh, get them a little bit hungry and let them, let them do a little damage there and see how it works. Experiment mm-hmm. with it, but it's not an all or nothing thing. Well, th- when I heard this, when I was doing the research for the episode, I was really excited because I grew up actually on a, uh, rotational grazing beef operation. And oh, of cool. course, because of that, in the first couple of years, I was out there digging these huge, or at least they seemed huge to me at the time, Canada thistles. I, I mean, they're like some alien species from a sci-fi film. Uh-huh. Right. But, so are there any projects you're currently working on that you'd like to share with the audience? Um, yeah, so continuing to work on O-grain. Uh, and so what I can say for your audience, in case there's potential organic grain farmers that are listening. You know, we have a lot of programming through O-Grain that I, I didn't mention. We um, we have a lot of field days. So throughout the summer, we have on-farm field days that I host with sometimes other organizations like Moses, uh, organization that puts on the big organic farming conference in the cross every year. We also host it in conjunction with the farmer. And the topics of that day are dictated pretty much by the farmer and by the community. So we just had one a couple of weeks ago that focused on on-farm grain storage uh, and small grains, food-grade small grains. They're growing for, you know, barley for beer and, and wheat for, for bread. Um, we have another one coming up on August 24th, just next Thursday, uh, at Wallendahl Farm up in Grand Marsh, Wisconsin, that is focusing on a lot of things, imaginative rotation, but it's a, it's a larger-scale farm, so we're hoping to kind of cover how to transition a large-scale farm by a couple hundred acres at a time to organic and what tools you might need, what, what implements you might need to invest in. Uh, and we're also going to focus on dry bean production, as, among other things. Um, we also have a big January winter workshop. It's two days, 20-plus guest speakers and panelists, zero to 60, pretty much everything you need to know to get started growing organic grain. That'll, again, be this January. I believe it'll be the 27th. We also have a mentor-to-mentor, farmer-to-farmer training program that we host through Moses that if you are a young farmer who wants to be paired with a farmer who's experienced, let us know. We can we can uh, forge that relationship for you, um, and so you can get the mentorship that you need. We're building a website right now and working on some videos that will be going live in the next couple of months. So there's a, a lot happening. Uh, stay tuned. It's, it's pretty exciting stuff. It sounds awesome. Thank you so much, Andres, for being on the show. I have one last question that this is kind of just a curiosity question for me. Do you think that more people are getting into organic feed grains or organic food grains? Mm, Organic feed or organic food, that that is the question. Um, The way that I see it is most people that are doing food grades are also doing feed. I think that they complement each other very nicely for a couple of reasons. If you think about the market, you know, you can shoot for food. You're always going to get more for food. It's going to be higher quality. It's going to be harder to grow. You're going to have issues like fusarium head blight that are going to be challenges. Um, but if you are successful enough to grow food grade, yeah, then you then you get a payoff. That's great. But if you don't make food grade, then you also still have a feed. You still mm-hmm. have something that you can sell. Um, and so I think a rotation is also going to be able to, it's going to necessitate feed and food. You might be able to do food grade wheat. You might be able to do, you know, sell some oats to grain millers, but then you need to rotate back into corn and soybeans to really be able to make, make your land cash flow. And there is food grade corn, but feed grade corn is easy to grow and there's a market for it. Same for soybeans. Food grade soybeans are really hard to grow. Um, so you can do feed grade soybeans as well. So I think that I wouldn't recommend one or the other. I think that they complement each other really nicely. If you're getting into organic grain, you're likely going to be experimenting with both. Well, thank you very much, Anders. I appreciate it. Thanks for being on the show and have a fantastic rest of your day. I hope you'll be on again on the show sometime. My pleasure. Good to talk to you. Biomimicry. I like that word. The book is already in my Amazon shopping cart, and if you want to create it yourself, you can click the link below. To learn more about Anders' work with O-Grain, take a look at the links we've included in the description. All of our links can also be found below, including the email sign-up form. You can support the show by not only signing up, but by also subscribing to the podcast on whatever listening medium you use. And leave us a nice review sometime. As always, I'm Terrence Lehew. This has been the Intellectual Agrarian Podcast, reminding you to keep... Farming the dream.